Hello, my beautiful, beautiful, beautiful people. Today, we are going to look at two nations, two destinies. We are going to examine, is it possible for someone to be an enlightened despot? And then we're going to turn direction and look at late 18th century France and the ensuing financial crisis and constitutional crisis is how we are going to finish up today's lesson. We last left off with the rise of Prussia. It's taken uh, parts of Poland. It's taken Silesia from the Austrian Empire here. And we also looked at Louis XIV and France, two nations, two very different destinies. These two nations, first under Louis XIV and then under Frederick the Great, will grow um, in stature, in power, uh, and they will remain rivals throughout the 1800s. Two very, very different uh, kingdoms, but with the same objective, and that is domination of continental Europe. These are going to have giant implications, not only in the 19th century, but in the 20th century. Uh, let us go back and look further at these two very, very different nations. An enlightened despot. Well, we, when we looked at the philosophes, saw that they were calling for a new kind of leader. Those who were in favor of monarchy, and they all weren't, were in favor of monarchs who would embrace the ideals of the Enlightenment. And none other, no other, pardon me, king or emperor of the 18th century will embrace the Enlightenment like Frederick the Great. Now, Please remember, he remains an absolute monarch, hence uh, the phrase, an enlightened despot. He embraces many of the ideals of the Enlightenment, um, but he rules absolutely, and he will shut down any speech that puts his reign in jeopardy or his stature in jeopardy. Please, please, please know that. However, we can get insight into one of his quotes when it comes to embracing uh, new ideas. He is quoted as having said, the greatest and noblest pleasure we can have in this world is to discover new truths, and the next is to shake off old prejudices. I think that quote works even today. Uh, there's another quote I, I came across uh, 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 some time ago, which makes me chuckle. He hated the fact that coffee was increasingly being uh, a drunk drank in his kingdom. He lamented the fact that his soldiers were drinking such a substance. He wanted his soldiers to drink beer. And remember, Prussia is a nation of soldiers. He said this, it is disgusting to notice the increase in the quantity of coffee used by my subjects and the amount of money that goes out of the country as a consequence. Prussia doesn't grow coffee, obviously. Uh, everybody is using coffee. This must be prevented. His majesty was brought up on beer, and so were both of his ancestors and officers. Many battles have been fought and won by soldiers nourished on beer, and the king does not believe that coffee-drinking soldiers can be relied upon to endure hardships in case of another war. So maybe he wasn't so enlightened when it came to uh, beverages, but he certainly had his opinions. Religious policies. Well, by modern standards, he wasn't exactly enlightened when it came to his religious policies. But on paper, on paper, you had equality among the religions of the kingdom of Prussia. That being said, Catholics, who were a minority, it was by far a majority Protestant nation, uh, did face uh, social prejudices. And you didn't rise through the ranks in the military um, like you would if you were a Protestant. You would not reach the highest echelons of the military as a Catholic in Prussia. As for Jews, not a major segment of the population, but certainly a segment of the population, they were much freer uh, than to the East. Uh, within the Russian Empire, my God, uh, things were very, very bad for Jews uh, in the Russian Empire. However, 
However, on paper, Jews received all of the protection and support from the king as any other Prussian citizen. However, they were required to pay special taxes and were not permitted into the military. Again, by modern standards, not exactly enlightened for the time, for the time, as compared to the East, quite enlightened. Um, the majority of Jews living in Europe, uh, for the record, are living within the Russian Empire um, in the pale of settlement, um, modern day Eastern Europe. Uh, they lived there by law. The Russian emperors, who were incredibly anti Semitic, blamed them for everything, uh, forced them to live in that region there. Prussia is just on the other side, just on the other side over there. By the way, that population uh, center in World War II will have a, a, a very giant consequences. Uh, we'll get there, but just know that's where the majority of Jews live in Europe. Personal views on religion. He was certainly an agnostic. He wasn't sure. How can anyone be sure of anything when it comes to faith? He may be a secret uh, deist, which we discussed in an earlier lesson. Um, he was quite critical of Christianity in many ways, as were many members of the Enlightenment. Um, he called Christianity, quote, an old metaphysical fiction stuffed with miracles, contradictions, and absurdities, which was spawned in the fervent imagination of the Orientals. That's anyone who lives in the East, not East Asia like we use today. And then spread to our Europe, where some fanatics espoused it, some intriguers pretended to be convinced by it, and some imbeciles actually believed it. So not exactly the biggest fan of Christianity. But again, on paper, all of our citizens are equal. And for the record, Frederick the Great's biggest focus was, was who can he, who can make his, his kingdom better? And so Huguenot refugees were welcomed, um, a great many diverse people were welcomed uh, to a limit uh, within the realm. Freemasonry. Frederick the Great was a Freemason. Oh my God, very controversial. Uh, like many leading figures of the Enlightenment, he was a Freemason. Uh, they were founded in the early 1700s as a fraternity dedicated to the ideals of the Enlightenment. They claim to have a history back to the medieval guilds. Um, that is somewhat questionable, but they certainly emerged in the early 1700s dedicated to reason, free thought, etc. Um, very secretive, very secretive, uh, quite elite in many areas. Uh, your lawyers, your politicians, etc. become Freemasons, highly secretive, of course, uh, Frederick becoming a Freemason actually gave it a lot of legitimacy uh, within Europe. The fact that he was a proud member of the Freemasons gave um, it, again, some respectability and a little bit less uh, uh, whispers. Uh, he was not the only head of state to have become a Freemason. Our own founding father, George Washington, was a Freemason, as was a great many other U.S. presidents. Uh, that being said, uh, because of their because of their secrecy, because of the rituals, because uh, the doors are closed, that sometimes is all you need. Rumors about the Masons continued over the 1800s, even into the 1900s, maybe even presently. Uh, you might want to surf the internet if you want to get some good conspiracies. Again, conspiracies. Uh, they were likened to... Uh, the occult, not fair at all. Uh, even charges of Satanism were levied at the Masons. Again, absolute nonsense. Um, but again, never let the truth get in the way of some good gossip. Another organization founded in the 1700s was the Illuminati. Yes, the Illuminati um, began in Bavaria, another German kingdom, although they were shut down. In the end, they were shut down. They were dedicated to the same ideals as the Masons, a fraternal order like the Masons, a secret brotherhood like the Masons, the King of Bavaria got tired, saw them as a threat, and shut it down. And the Illuminati is no longer. Or is it? Art and culture. Art and culture. Frederick was dedicated to the promotion of art and culture within his kingdom. He did not found 
but he certainly helped to build up the Prussian Academy of Sciences, much like the London Society, although much more top down. It's not nearly as as free. Um, Prussia, again, is not the libertine uh, liberal kingdom of Britain at this time. It's just not. Uh, but again, we are dedicated to the sciences. We are dedicated to the promotion of ideas and 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 in leaps and bounds in the sciences. Um, he was also our Frederick the Great, a great promoter of philosophy. And it was during his reign um, in his kingdom that perhaps the greatest philosopher of the time, Immanuel Kant, emerged. His writings on religion would have been banned had he been writing in most of Europe outside of Britain. Um, but again, he there was no threat to Frederick, and so he was allowed to continue to uh, write and 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 teach as a professor. He kept correspondence with certain philosophes. Uh, he was especially close to Voltaire. Voltaire visited him uh, several times at his palace. Again, though, again, he separated his love of philosophy with his need to rule. He famously said this, if I wished to punish a province, I would have have it governed by philosophers. So he knows, he knows that he has to keep these worlds very, very separate. Um, and he's very pragmatic. What works on paper doesn't necessarily work in a kingdom. Frederick was also a musician. He was a musician as well as a great patron of music. Uh, he played the flute. He composed 100 sonatas for the flute as well as four symphonies. This man was dedicated to improvement. And this is a central ideal of the Enlightenment. Every human is capable of improving. Remember, we are blank slates, are we not? He spoke many languages. He was a polyglot. In addition to his native German, uh, Frederick spoke French, which all royalty in Europe would have spoken French. That was the lingua franca at the time, just so you know. All of them outside of Britain spoke French in the home. And any monarch of Britain would certainly be able to speak French. That was the one language that everyone could speak. It used to be Latin for the church. It becomes French. Brit English doesn't really replace French as the lingua franca until the uh, late 19th century. But he spoke French, Italian, English, Spanish, and Portuguese. He also understood Latin, ancient and modern Greek, as well as Hebrew. That being said, he hated the German language. He disliked it profusely. He hated German writers. He hated German operas. He once was heard to have said this, a German singer, I should as soon expect to get pleasure from the neighing of my horse. In fact, he only spoke German to one thing in his world, and that was his horse. He spoke German to his horse. Uh, you can still see his beloved horse. Uh, Condi. Condi is uh, in Berlin still. It's at the museum. Uh, she's not doing great. She's not doing fantastic. Uh, could eat a bit, but there she is. You could say hello to her from me. Building projects. If we are going to be a great kingdom, we need a great capital. And Frederick the Great went about building in Berlin, his capital city. A great many beautiful buildings were made during his reign with his financing, with his overseeing these projects. We have the Berlin State Opera House. Now, why this is so important, all other opera houses in Northern Europe were attached to palaces. They were for royalty. They were for the aristocracy exclusively. The Berlin State Opera House is not connected to a royal palace. It's for the people. That is a sh tremendous shift, very enlightened for its time, for its time. We have the Berlin Royal Library. What is more important for uh, an enlightened despot than to provide uh, learning for his subjects? The Church of St. Hedwig is a fantastic symbol of the enlightenment, of an enlightened ruler. This is a Catholic church in a Lutheran city built by an agnostic ruler. You see, you see how all of these things for their time are considered very enlightened. 
the Prince Henry Palace, now Humboldt University. Absolutely gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. However, his most beloved building projects was his summer residence, Sans Souci. Sans Souci. It translates from the French to carefree or without worry. Here he is with Voltaire at Sans Souci. Absolutely gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. Um, he designs, he designs uh, this palace. Um, and it's more of a villa than a palace. I'm going to, I'm going to take you to this palace. Just know that it wasn't as ornate when he lived there. Later rulers of Prussia made it more ornate and he kept a minimum amount of servants at Sans Souci. He wanted to be more independent and alone with his thoughts. Absolutely gorgeous, though. Beautiful gardens, running water, without care, without worry. Painstaking attention to detail. Is it Versailles? No, but it's not supposed to be Versailles. It's not supposed to be Versailles. It acts as a gallery in the present time. But I have a soft spot in my heart for Sans Souci. Very French in its appearance. The French set the standard in the 1700s. If you wanted style, if you wanted taste, you went to France. You want French designers, French architects. The China House. We're going to learn why are Europeans becoming obsessed with the East in the late 1700s? Well, we're going to go to China. We're going to find out. But the China House, a little playhouse in the back. How fun. I can guarantee the uh, designer, the architect, had never been to East Asia. This is just what we thought it should look like, what we thought they should look like. Gorgeous, nonetheless. Later years, later years, he spent more and more time at San Susi, hanging out with his Italian greyhounds they were his favorite uh he became more reflective in his older years hanging out at his personal residence he was famous for continuing to wear his blue uniform covered in snuff stains what is snuff it's powdered tobacco uh and in the late 18th century all the gentlemen of europe uh did snuff you literally you sniff it uh, think of it as tobacco cocaine uh, is the only way I could explain it. Um, but he would have snuff stains on his jacket. Uh, he later said late in life, a crown is merely a hat that lets the rain in. Sounds like a philosopher king. Oh, by the way, that's what Voltaire called our Frederick the Great, a philosopher king. He dies 17th of August, 17. 86 childless he'll never have a child uh the throne will go to his nephew uh in an armchair in his study there is the death mask of frederick the great this is quite common this was quite common when you died they would apply plaster to your face and have a death mask for you remember this is before photography it's a way and you could and that way that could go on tour and people could say goodbye to their great king now his last wishes in his Will, he wanted to be buried on the grounds of Sans Souci, right alongside his beloved greyhounds. That was his wish. That was his wish. Well, the new emperor of Prussia, his nephew, Frederick William, said, that is ridiculous. I will not let him do that. And so he had Frederick the Great buried at Potsdam Garrison Church, right next to Frederick the Great's father. 
And this is where he stayed for quite some time until the Second World War. Until the Second World War, Berlin is being bombed. Berlin is being bombed. Hitler does not want the German national hero, Frederick the Great, to be bombed, obviously. So he moves Frederick and his father to a... Uh, to a salt mine outside of Berlin. Berlin is, is, is being destroyed by the Allies. Carpet bombing, the Soviets are, are, are mere miles away. He is moved to a salt mine. His coffin is there. Well, it's discovered by the Americans shortly after the war, as is many things. Um, and the Americans move his coffin to the family seat uh, at the castle Hohenzollern. This is the family seat seat of power this is the ancestral seat of his family's uh, uh, uh of his family well he will stay there he will stay there until the 205th anniversary of his death august 1991 where he is finally laid to rest with full honors he is draped in the prussian flag and his final wishes are actually answered. He is placed at Sansui, um, where he stays to this day. If you visit his grave, and you certainly should, you have to leave a potato. Why do they leave a potato at Frederick the Great's grave? Well, it's an interesting story, a very quick story, but a story nonetheless. Potatoes are new. They're from the New World. Frederick the Great saw the power of the potato it grows anywhere it can grow in terrible climates and it has a lot of calories it's good well europe suffers from famine we have way too many people many people are poor he wants the prussian people to start growing the potato they don't want to they don't trust it they don't like it it's foreign to them so what does he do he starts potato fields near his palace royal potato fields and he puts guards out in front don't let anyone near these potato fields. Well, people start looking. They want to see. Don't come near here. What are you growing? Potatoes. Well, people are like, wait, you, if he's putting guards around this potato field, these things must be amazing. These things. And it works. The Prussian people begin growing potatoes, uh, and they've been eating potatoes ever since. Another nickname, by the way, was uh, Old Fritz. Fritz is another word for Frederick. Um, and uh, another word for potatoes, Fritz. So I don't know. I don't know if that. Uh, I don't know if that works. Uh, wait, palm fritz. No, it's not another word for potato. I'm completely insane. <laughs> Never mind. I'm not a polyglot like uh, Frederick. But that's why you leave a potato at his grave. Legacy, legacy, legacy. Until the Second World War, German historians often made him the romantic model. He becomes the model of what it means to be a leader. A warrior, a philosopher, efficient. He becomes the model. This is a quote of, 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 of his. Again, I have a lot of these, but he, he, he was so good. This is what he said about ruling. I can have no interests which are not equally those of my people. If the two are incompatible, the preference is always to be given to the welfare and advantage of the country. He lays the basis. He lays the basis. A strong central state, an incredibly well-disciplined, advanced army prussia is going to spread prussia is going to give birth to something and we're going to see it we're going to see it and frederick's two sides kind of become the two sides of germany um in the 1800s and early 1900s one side is incredibly cultured Germany has the best universities, the best philosophers, the best uh, musicians. They just do throughout the 1800s. But also with that culture comes a militarism, which will have giant effects as well. And that's the duality of, of the German uh, uh, state during this time. We're going to get there. But just know he lays that framework. He gives them a model in which to build from. Okay, let's move from the Prussian kingdom to late 18th century France. We are going to the late 1700s in France. Events in France in the late 1700s are going to push it increasingly, increasingly into a state of chaos and collapse. Let's look at some key moments, events uh, during this time. 
First, there was the Seven Years' War. The Seven Years' War. This was fought. We saw this. Uh, Prussia was involved in this. This was fought by Louis the Fifteenth. Now, he is the great-grandson of Louis the Fourteenth and his successor. That happens a lot. Sons die. And so it doesn't always go from the father to the son. Uh, sometimes it's the great-grandson, a nephew, etc. The result of the Seven Years' War is manyfold. Many, many fold. A great many things happened because of this. But very briefly, we saw how beginning in the 1600s, beginning in the 1600s, the French um, have explored and claimed all of this new territory, all of this new territory called New France um, from modern day Canada all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. This is New France. The French do quite a good job of building connections with the natives, not by no means were their relationship always good, no, but better than usually than the British with the Native Americans. Now, the French are going to make a fortune in the fur trade. See, even then, the French were making money off of fashion. And they're going to take France to the new world, just as um, England will bring houses of representation, uh, 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 certain, certain, certain religious toleration to the new world well france brings its culture to the new world um that includes direct rule by a um royal governor uh zero religious toleration if you're not catholic you're not welcome a strict social hierarchy and very little private property new france is never going to be as populated as as the british colonies um and they do not enjoy hardly any of the rights that the British enjoy. They are working on land that is not their own and uh, have little to no say in their daily lives. But New France is thriving. And New France wants to control their position. And so they begin building, they begin building forts all along this region to prevent the English colonists from moving further west. Well, the English colonies have charters, ancient charters, uh, that promise all lands to the ocean is theirs. Virginia, North Carolina, Massachusetts, Connecticut, they claim all of that land. And now the French are building forts. A young George Washington, a young George Washington, this is long before any war of independence, he is working as a, uh, in a, member, of, uh, as a member of the Virginia militia, he is sent out to investigate these forts, and he does. He brings with him a force. Well, fighting breaks out, and this kicks off the Seven Years' War in this country known as the French-Indian War. But if, and you can call it that if you're discussing what's happening in North America, but remember, there's another war going on back in Europe at the same time, the Seven Years' War. Led his troops in a battle and accidentally started the French and Indian War, Mr. Washington. Mr. Washington, remember, it was the Prussians back in Europe that allowed the British to focus on North America. France has just signed a treaty with Austria. Spain has joined them. Russia has joined them. Sweden has joined them. Great Britain should have been destroyed. But Prussia has also formed an alliance with Great Britain. The Seven Years' War is won because of Prussia's help. Things come to an end when the British take Quebec. This is the mouth of New France. You take Quebec, you take all of New France. And in a daring raid, General Wolfe storms Quebec. He dies in the process, but the French city of Quebec falls. And with it, all of New France. All of this land that was once New France suddenly becomes part of the British Empire. Part of the British Empire. Win the French and Indian War, tax all the colonists. Now, that is a different class. That's American history. But just know there's a history there, and the story is much wider than perhaps you knew. That being said, that being said, France is humiliated. She loses almost all of her North American holdings. She's bankrupt. And her position in Europe has been reduced. The perception of France has been greatly reduced. And on top of that, financially, they're doing badly. This is a terrible blow to the French. At the same time, in the late 1700s, 
the population is exploding in France. Less plague, better living conditions. The population is continuing to increase. Look at that jump in the 1700s, all the way to the left. Never mind that gap. That gap we're going to study. That's when France collapses. So forget about the gap. They don't even keep records. But look at that population jump. Millions of more people are in France in the 1700s as compared to the 1600s. The food supply is slow to keep up. On the backdrop of all of this, just know that increasingly we are having problems in feeding the poor. And at the end of the day, we can talk about philosophy, we can talk about ideals, but when a man and woman are hungry, when their child is starving, things get desperate. Things will get desperate in France. Also, in the late 1700s, we are feeling the effects of the Enlightenment. It was very fashionable to sit in a salon in Paris and discuss the Enlightenment. Even the aristocracy are discussing the ideals of the Enlightenment, and these ideas are growing and growing and growing through the printing press, through the printing press. Please know that by 1789, 90%, nine zero of the uh, population of Paris, male population at least, is literate. They can read. And these ideas are spreading like wildfire. Ideas based in the Enlightenment become very dangerous for the monarchy in France. Things like, don't trust authority, test it yourself. It seems harmless, right? But think about it. Think about it. Test it yourself through reason. Don't trust authority just because it's authority. It should be tested like in science. What else? This idea that progress is natural and inevitable. Things change. Things have to change. That's very, 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 very uh, age of reason-ish. Um, but again, that has effects when it comes to the way you view your sovereign, your government. The belief that you can abandon tradition and institutions and build something based on reason. Cast it aside. If it doesn't work, try something else. These ideas spread within the kingdom. These ideas are dangerous. That's also happening on the backdrop of everything I'm talking about. People are hungry and they're being injected with these new ideas. Who is the heir to the throne? Who is the crown prince? Well, it is the king's grandson, the Dauphin Louis. Louis was bashful. He was hesitant. He was indecisive. He was pudgy. He was shy. These are not characteristics of a good king. Just know that. Just know that. He, he wasn't a bad man, but he wasn't perhaps the man he could have or should have been at this time, right? It depends when you're born on how well you do, depending on the situation. He's the wrong, he's the wrong crown prince for this time in France. Uh, Louis XV's mistress, the uh, Madame du Barry, uh, called him, quote, a fat, ill-bred boy. And he's next in line for the throne. So keep that in mind. Let's go back to that treaty with Austria. Why did the French make a treaty with the Austrians? They've been enemies forever. They hate each other. The Austrians and the French detest each other. Austria is ruled by the Habsburgs. And the Bourbons of France, the French royal family, they detest each other. But they're both afraid of the rise of Britain and the rise of Prussia. And so they form an alliance in 1756. This is what allows France to enter the Seven Years' War. This was supposed to guarantee it. Anyways, Louis XV and the Empress of the Austrian Empire, Maria Theresa, enter into this treaty. They enter into this treaty. Mutual protection. If one of us are attacked, we both jump in. Again, they're both afraid of the rise of Britain and the rise of Prussia. And so the Austrians here, with territories also here, and France enter into a union. They're afraid of Prussia, well, Austria is for the most part, and France is afraid of Britain. But we need to seal the deal. And this is what we do in the 1700s. This is what we've done for thousands of years. Maria Theresa will marry off her youngest daughter to the king of France's grandson 
And next in line, Louis. Here he is, right here, right there. He's dressed. Uh, uh, that's how babies were dressed. Even my dad. I have an old photograph of him dressed almost, almost in a dress. Um, uh, that's another story, but that was very common. Just so you know, I didn't show the wrong slide. This is a business transaction. Now, don't worry. They're young. They're young. We'll do it years from now. 12 years from now, we'll marry them. It's a deal. It's not about love for the record. Poor people can marry for love. If you are a member of the aristocracy, you are used as a pawn to unite families. Um, this is just the way it was done for centuries. This is how we're going to seal the deal, the treaty between the French and the Austrians. One time mortal enemies, we can now hopefully be friends. Who was the youngest daughter of Maria Theresa, the Empress of the Austrians? Well, she was very young. She did not know much about the nation that she was headed for. She wasn't terribly educated at all. She was the youngest daughter. She was just kind of raised feral, to be honest, within the palace. Very headstrong, very lively, uh, very, very attractive, intelligent, just not educated, very musical as well. When she's told about this union with the future king of France, she is certain, she's certain that they're going to fall madly in love and live happily ever after. She had no idea about court life at Versailles. She had no idea how much the Austrians were detested in France. Um, her mother did her a tremendous disservice. She didn't prepare her the way that she should have. Well, in 1770, the now 14-year-old princess um, is taken to the borderland between France and the German states, the Rhine. The Rhine is the traditional border between the German states and France. She is going to literally and figuratively cross into France, leaving everything that she was behind her and become a French noble woman. Right here, right here is the Rhine. Anyways, they meet on a small island right on the river. And the river separates these two lands. A giant pavilion is constructed. This is a very, very, very uh, a symbolic and ceremonial occasion. Um, on the pavilion, there was a, a table covered with red velvet. Um, and what happened next was she had all of her clothes removed in private with her court ladies and French clothes were put on all of the ladies from court that she brought with her are sent back to Austria and she's given new ladies of the court. She enters, she enters Marie Antonia. However, when she leaves this Island and enters France, she enters as Marie Antoinette, which is the Frank, the, 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 the Frankenized version of her Austrian name, Marie Antoinette. This was supposed to represent her dropping of her Austrian uh, nationality and the adoption of being French. Even though, for the record, she spoke French at home, she had more French blood than Louis, uh, she will never be seen as a French woman. She will always be seen as an Austrian. And they will call her, the French people will call her uh, the Austrian woman, which is not kind. They will never accept her. Um, and then she will not do any favors for herself in the process, but she'll never be accepted as a French woman. And even though there's a treaty, the people of France continue to detest the Austrians. It was a royal wedding. It was a splendid affair. They had a beautiful ceremony. Here they are, young, beautiful couple. He's only 15, she's 14. They were supposed to have a giant fireworks during the celebrations, uh, but there was a thunderstorm. There was a thunderstorm. And so it had to be halted. After a long night of partying, they retired to the bed. Members of each family witness them getting into bed together. They don't watch the whole process by any means, but they want to make sure you're getting into bed together. You guys know what you're supposed to do, right? Well, they don't. They don't for years. They don't do what they're supposed to do. Her one job is to have an heir. And she's up for it. He's not. 
He's not up for it. Now, after two weeks of partying, they do have a fireworks show. They do have a th- fireworks show. Uh, however, there was a horrible explosion. It goes badly. 132 people will be killed in this fireworks show. It was a grim omen of a rain that would prove tragic. In 1774, King Louis dies. He dies of smallpox. The king died defeated and unpopular. Um, He left behind a nation on the brink of chaos. His grandson, a 20-year-old boy, takes the throne and he fills the world on his shoulders. He is quoted as having said or prayed to God, quote, protect us, Lord, for we reign too young. We reign too young. He's not prepared and he's not the man for this era. The American War of Independence. The American War of Independence kicks off shortly thereafter. The young king wants revenge. He wants revenge on the British. Benjamin Franklin, the rebel representative of the British colonists, um, is sent to France to try to convince the crown to give the rebels money and guns. He's the toast of Versailles, by the way. Benjamin Franklin is the perfect man to be sent to Versailles. He is exotic. He plays it up, too. He wears fur and leather. He pretends like he's some kind of woodsman. He's not. But what he is is brilliant and a child of the Enlightenment. He's more at home in Paris than he would be back even in Philadelphia. He becomes the toast of uh, Versailles. Anyways, the king agrees, not because he's impressed with Benjamin Franklin, it's because he wants revenge. I saw this meme. It made me laugh. America, can you help us with our revolution, friends? No, it's against the British. Oh, hell yes. Oh, hell yes. France sends exactly what the rebels need. Troops, ships, and guns and money. This is what they send. This is what they send. They also send some brilliant young officers like Lafayette, It's actually Lafayette that secures the last major battle of the uh, American Revolution. Yorktown, the British are finally defeated. The French move in with the Americans, and it's the French fleet here that defeat, that prevent the uh, British fleet from moving in and rescuing these uh, soldiers, these British soldiers. This is a humiliating defeat for the British. Um, They're tired, they're sick, they're outnumbered, and they surrender. Lord Cornwallis surrenders to not just the Americans, but also the French. It's a French victory. If there is a hero of uh, the Battle of York, it is certainly um, Lafayette, a Frenchman. At the Treaty of Paris that the British sign, uh, they all sit down for a painting. The British are too uh, mad, not gracious enough to sit for the painting. So they leave. The America's like, yeah, we'll sit all day. It's easier when you win. Under the Treaty of Paris of 1783, a new nation is made. A new nation is made, the United States of America. They gain even more land than they had before from the Atlantic to the Mississippi. But again, that's another class. The effects on France. The effects on France of the American Revolution. Well, they are in debt beyond belief. Furthermore, they have hundreds of Frenchmen returning home with crazy ideas, crazy ideas, ideas like all men are created equal. They wrote it down on this document. Oh, are you serious? Yeah. What? Really? Soon they're going to have a whole new constitution in this new nation, this republic that seems more reasonable. This group of Frenchmen returning home are also going to see how violence, how revolution actually works. Again, like wildfire, like a virus, these ideas come back to France. Finally, the financial crisis of the 1780s. France is collapsing financially. 50% of France's national budget went to simply paying off interests on loans by the 1780s. 35% of its budget goes to the military. 6% went to maintaining the king and his court at Versailles. 
20% of the national revenue could go to actually administering the uh, kingdom. That is not enough. That is not enough. There is also a series of bad crops, horrible effects on France. Things are getting worse and worse and worse in France. At the same time, we have an Austrian queen who becomes the symbol of the upper class's spending habits. She is nicknamed Madame Deficit because she spends, spends, spends. She has a husband that largely ignores her. She's young. She's having a good time. She spends in modern money the equivalent of millions on outfits. People hear about this. People know about this. You don't see it with your, with your own eyes, but it trickles down like gossip at a high school. She spent how much on that? My God. She becomes the symbol, unfairly, of the entire aristocracy. It's easier to hate a foreigner and a woman than it is to hate your beloved French king. And so she becomes the focus. She spends her time partying, playing games, playing instruments, gambling. Life in Versailles was debaucherous. And again, she's young, beautiful, and rich. Party after party while we starve. Party after party while our children die. This is the effect it's having on people. They're angry. And she still doesn't have any kids. She still doesn't have any kids. It's her one job. Now, no one knows that it's her husband's fault. She writes to her mother. I don't know. I don't know what's the matter with them. Her mother is quoted as having said, if a beautiful young girl like my daughter doesn't arouse something in this man, what the hell's the problem? It's got to be him. She is seen flirting with men, talking with men, giving rise to rumors. Now, the king is more interested in eating pastries. He's more interested in eating pastries than hanging out with his wife. He was an amateur locksmith. That's what he did for, for fun. He worked on locks. And there was a very popular song in France in the 1780s um, that went like, this approximately quote the locksmith was having a hard time finding the keyhole i think you know what, what that song meant but this is a time that if you're not virile if you don't have several children as a man you are seen as weak across the board if he can't impregnate his wife then perhaps he's not the man we deserve and so his stature begins to fall in the process then she does this and this she's not doing herself any favors let me guess Let's just erase everything I've just told you and just be with me now. What if the, uh, 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 the crown prince of, 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 of the United States was an Instagram personality, an influencer, I don't know what they're called, and he flaunts his cash, he flaunts his cash and the rest of us are starving. The rest of us are starving. And then you find out that him and his friends have built a mock trailer park behind his mansion or a mock housing project behind his mansion, and they play poor. They dress poor. They act poor. How would you feel? How would you feel knowing that for fun, they dress like a poor person while your kids starve? Well, this is what Marie Antoinette and her friends do. They dress like peasants, and they have built behind Versailles a replica French village where they dress like milkmaids, and they run around pretending to be peasants. Now, it's the Disneyland version of, but how do you think people feel when they hear stories like that? She does what? She dresses like what? She pretends to be what? This is what's happening in France at this time. All of these factors are at play, and people are getting mad. How much money does she spend on her wigs? I could live off that for the rest of my life. My village could live off of that. By the way, these wigs just kept getting bigger and bigger during this time. This was the fashion. They did put mock boats, et cetera, in them. This was the style. Absolutely impractical. Some literally needed people to walk with them, holding them up. Okay, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but you get the idea. And more and more people are finding out about this because of the printing press. These ideas, these rumors are spreading. I heard you like wigs, so we put a wig inside of a wig. Did you know that certain thieves train monkeys to steal wigs? True story. True story. They'd run up, grab your wig, and run away. And you could make a lot of money stealing wigs. 
1700s problems. <laughs> During this time, more and more rumors are spread that Louis is a cuckold, that his wife is cheating on him, that he is not the man we hoped he would be, that she is having affairs with everyone but him. This is bad. This is bad. And these images get much worse. I'm not going to show them to you. You can look them up if you want. Uh, they're very graphic. And they're very, very, very uh, insulting to the queen. She does end up having a child. Even better, a son with Louis. But it's too late. It's too late. Those, those ideas aren't going anywhere. Those firm beliefs aren't going anywhere among the French people. Now, Louis will try to reform. He will try to reform. The problem that France is facing isn't insurmountable, but the wealthiest of France refuse to pay taxes. They have special privileges. The nobility and the clergy do not have to pay taxes. If they would only pay taxes, we could get out of this. We could get out of this, but they refuse. You see, France is made up of three estates, the clergy, the nobles, and then the third estate, um, which is everyone else. Peasants, doctors, lawyers. If you're not an aristocrat and you're not a member of the clergy, you fall into the third estate. You pay all the taxes. You have none of the privileges that the clergy and the aristocracy have. You're carrying the weight. And these two groups refuse to pay taxes. Those are my ancient privileges. You can't make me do it, King. Learn to spend better. Sorry. Well, things come to a head. We need to do something. We need to do something. In 1789, in 1789, for the first time since the early 1600s, since 1614, Louis calls the Estates General. It's the only way he's going to be able to raise taxes. Elections are held throughout France. Throughout France, they're going to send representatives to Parliament, the Estates General. It has not been called since 1614. Uh, uh, Prior to the first meeting, many agree that real reform, not just economic reform, needs to come. Um, individual liberties, economic deregulations need to come. Even members of the aristocracy agree with this. We need more liberty in this kingdom. We want to be more like Britain. The problem is, is that in the Estates General, they vote in three separate blocks. You have the clergy, made up of representatives of the clergy. You have the aristocracy, made up of representatives of the aristocracy. And then you have everyone else. But they vote in blocks. Everyone, every group votes, and then that's one vote. And the two, the aristocracy and the clergy, always vote against the majority, which are the third estate, the peasantry. The nobility and the clergy agree to give the third estate, the peasants, more representation. But it doesn't matter because they still vote in blocks. You can give me a million members of the estates general, but I'm only one vote. And you two always outvote us. Meetings after meetings fall apart. Members of the third estate want individual voting. One man, one vote, period. The other two are refusing. After several meetings, they show up to the estates general, um, and the door's locked. The door is locked. The king's had enough. Done. Done. I'll figure out a different way. But members of the estates general find a tennis court at Versailles um, nearby, and they take an oath. They take an oath, the tennis court oath, and they are going to kick off a chain of events that matches even the Reformation when it comes to real revolution, real revolution. We are going to see how things unfold in France and how a locked door kicks off a new era in human history. Thank you all very, very, very much until we meet again.